So great to have you at church this morning. Huge welcome to everybody who's joining us online. And if you're watching on YouTube today, uh, we're glad that you're here. If you are watching on Facebook, we're glad that you're here. Uh, this morning, we're kind of streaming to both places. So some of you are there and others of you are in, on the other place. But we decided to do that. It's a lot easier to reach uh, people, especially we have a lot of guests on Facebook. So uh, I don't know whether you want to stay where you are. Maybe you want to switch channels, but wherever you are, we're so glad that you are here this morning. We're in for a pretty big day. We are kicking off a series today. It's a series that we do every single year uh, oh, yeah. and it's called You Ask For. It's probably one of the most oh. popular series that we do. And if you are new to church, you don't normally come to church, well, just want to let you know how this thing works. Uh, what we did this year is we put up a, a whole heap of topics that were, well, probably controversial and uh, things that people disagree about and have strong opinions about and uh, things that are just really relevant. And then we gave everyone the opportunity to vote for what they wanted to hear most. And uh, well, guys, you know what? It seemed like a really good idea at the time. And uh, sometimes I do. I come to this point in the You Ask For It series and I think, you know, things were going so well. I turned 40 last week and church is going well. And how could we blow everything up in just a couple of weeks? We do this series every year. It's called You Ask For It. And uh, we are going to do this series because I'm kind of joking. Or am I? Um, I am kind of joking, but it is funny because there are so many divisive topics that are around at the moment. And I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about today in just a moment. But before I do that, let me give you a bit of an overview of the series and where we're going. Next week, I'm going to be speaking about transgender rights. And that is going to be an interesting message. And so I encourage you to come and, and to listen to that. Uh, week three, my wife, Pastor Sarah, beautiful Pastor Sarah, she is going to preach a message on Western idols. Is that just a thing of the past? Uh, yeah, she's getting a lot of woos here on site. Okay, so so anyway, we're, she's going to do a message on Western idols. That is not just a thing of the past. There are absolutely idols that people have today. She's going to talk all about that. And then in the last week of this series, it only goes for four weeks. In the last week, uh, I'm going to do a message about end times. Now, these were the most requested messages. And let me tell you something else. This year... Uh, the voting was extreme, like in the sense that we had probably triple what we normally get. Uh, and so I'm going to kick off this series with probably, I think this was the most requested message. I don't know if I would choose this, but this is the message that people want to hear. Should Christians get vaccinated, right? And, and, and really vaccinated for the COVID-19 uh, vaccination. Should they get that and the reason that I say that is because this message is so big. There are so many areas that this message could go. But I am not going to talk about lockdown. Hands up if you hate lockdown. Yeah, well, we all agree. We all hate that. Um, and I'm not really talking about lockdown. And I'm not necessarily talking about all vaccines because, I mean, that's, a, that's another topic. That's a, that's a big topic. So what I want to do today is just talk about whether Christian people should get vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus. And so this is a really important thing for us to, to talk about. And, uh, and I feel like at the moment we are living in a world where there is just information overload. There is so much content out there and it's so accessible to everyone. I mean, it's not hard. You go on the internet and out there in the cloud, there is just so much information. And here's part of the problem that we have. There is a lot of misinformation. And I don't say that in a position of authority where I say, but I know everything. Like, no, no, no. I'm saying that I have to work my way through it. I, like you, have got to try to figure out what's real and what's not. This is a, this is a hard thing. In fact, let me tell you how hard it is. MIT, they did a study on this and they discovered that when it comes to fake news, thank you, Donald Trump, when it comes to false information, that fake news travels 70% faster than real news. 70% faster. In fact, what people have discovered is that it takes six times as long for real information to get to people. Do you know what that means? That means that it's really hard to come across what's true, and it's really easy to come across what's false, what's fake, and I'm telling you, I am just in the same place as so many people. I mean, I've had multiple people send me clips and 
ask for like a review and it's not one or two. So if you sent it to me, I'm not necessarily talking about only you because there are multiple, multiple people that said, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? It's kind of hard to sit back and review everything that, that, that is sent to me, right? But, but I'm like you. I mean, I'm sifting through content and information and data and trying to find out, hey, what's real and what's not? And what should we listen to? And what should we avoid? And, and it's a challenge, right? And I think that, you know, probably every single one of us would, we would probably know someone that we might consider to be a conspiracy theorist. If you don't know one, it's probably you, um, but, but not really. But, but we would probably know someone that we might consider to be a conspiracy theorist, someone that has just extreme ideas and they're always uh, sharing information. And you know what, where, where a lot of this content and a lot of this information comes from, it comes from YouTube. I swear some people think that they have a doctorate. They got their official doctorate from YouTube. And we have to be really careful these days about when we say we've researched something. When we say we've researched something, you know, I sometimes wonder, well, how deep did we really research it? Did we just find a bunch of clips? And, and, and amazingly, one clip led to the next, which led to the next. Then you just went down the rabbit warren of information um, on YouTube from people that seem to be in positions of authority that kind of freaked you out. And did is that what research really is? And, you know, I have seen this happen and I, I have explained this to some people and I'm probably susceptible to it as well. I'll put myself out there, but I would say this is that, you know, what we really discover is that Facebook, YouTube, these, these social media platforms, they have an algorithm that manipulates your feed and continues to feed to you what you're interested in because their goal and their objective is probably not to get truth to you, but to keep you online. And one of the best ways to keep you online is to reinforce your bias and to keep you looking at things that are going to bring fear and intrepidation. I, I promise you, I think that fear is commanding so much online media at the moment. And we have got a lot of people that are scared and afraid and I get it because there's lots of scary and uh, you know information that's out there and so one of the things that I thought about in preparing for this message is I thought hey you know what would be really useful right now would be if we just had data stats information you know like real info that we can look at and rely on right and then I just thought oh, who am I kidding who am I kidding you could bring out stats and information. People aren't going to necessarily believe it. It doesn't matter what we present. There's always a way to poke holes in information and disbelieve data. And if everything's fake and everything's phony, and if we can't believe anything, well, where does that kind of put us? And it, honestly, I think it is a real challenge. I mean, eventually we have to decide, you know, like, who are we going to trust? And eventually you're going to align with something. You will form a perspective. You will, in the end, have an idea about where you stand. Everyone is standing somewhere. And in some sense, you know, do we, do we trust the scientists that are telling us one thing? Or do we trust Barry in Bayswater who found a clip that really freaked me out? You know, like, who am I going to believe? There's just so much of this information. And, and part of the problem is, and I'll fully just want to asterisk and acknowledge this, that there are creditable sources on both ends of the spectrum. People that know information and look like they are in a position of authority and they're saying completely different things and in the middle of this we're like where do we find advice you know like you could go to your local gp and say hey what do you think but there are so many people that just would not trust their doctor because barry from basewater sent that clip and you know something that your gp doesn't know and so how do we figure this out like where do we go and and i think that really what's happening is we have a much larger issue that, that all of this is really pointing to, which is that we have a, a problem with trusting people in positions of authority. We actually have this problem of wanting to resist authority. And I think that this, this issue is probably, you know, especially for Australians, this has probably been here for some time now where we're not sure whether we trust the man, we're not sure whether we trust the person in a position of authority, but this is... This is a challenge and I'm not saying that we shouldn't be smart and educated and think for ourselves and, and research the best that we can. 
But if all we ever enforce, especially with our children, is that you can't trust anyone in a position of authority, eventually that thing is going to bite us in the butt. And the reason that it will is those children will grow up and they're not going to trust anyone or anything. And guess what, parents? Eventually you become a person in a position of authority and maybe one day they won't even trust you. And so we have to be careful about how we think about and, and how we address all of these issues. So what I thought I'd do today is I'm just going to look at really three things. And the first thing is, is what does the Bible really say about vaccines? What's the biblical perspective on this? And then point number two, how do we approach what we believe. How do we approach what we believe? Because some of us are still at the end of this message going to walk away believing different things and that's totally okay. In fact, I'm going to say if you believe or, or feel comfortable with 70% of what I say today, guess what? I'm going to notch it up as a win because there are so many different uh, realms of thought and ideas that people have. And so, you know, how do we approach what we believe? And then finally, we're going to, we're going to read and we're going to listen to what some of the experts say. Insert eye roll moment right now. Um, because the moment that I say experts, we say, oh, and who are they? You know, and I get it. I understand it. I'm right there with you. So why don't we just start here. Firstly, what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says absolutely nothing about taking a vaccine. It says nothing about vaccines per se. I know that when I read the Old Testament, one of the things that's really important to God and to the Israelite people was the protection and the preservation of life. Keeping people alive was very, very important to them, and it should be. You know, I remember doing a re some research for a, a message I did on Father's Day. I was looking at what Hebrew fathers did with their children. You know, one of the responsibilities of a Hebrew dad was to teach their children how to swim because there were moments where maybe to escape or to evade uh, 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 enemies that were coming, they had to swim. And the preservation of life was so important that it was a responsibility of Hebrew dads to teach their children how to swim. The preservation of life is important. And I like that. That really resonates with me, as I'm sure it probably does with you. And so in the interest of preservation of life and unashamedly some self-preservation. I thought one of the things that I should probably do is go and speak to a doctor and not just listen to everything that was coming into my YouTube channel or, or, or feed and not look at every clip that was coming in on Facebook, but why don't I just literally go and speak to a doctor? So I booked an appointment because I actually have an autoimmune issue. Uh, and, and so I, I grew up with this. This affected me when I was younger and I, I wanted to know if taking the vaccine was safe. So, so my GP is a, is a Christian. I know he's a Christian because he kept a picture. He literally keeps a picture of Jesus on his desk. And when he talks about Jesus, I know that he is a Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian who's aware of everything I think I know and so much more. So I met with him and I said, I, I want to help understand this and unpack this. And I want to know about taking vaccines. And is this something that is really safe for me? I said, what do you think about all of this? And he said, well, I think right now, one of the biggest dangers that we're facing as a culture, and he just reinforced everything that I, I guess I already believe to be true, which is that right now there's so much misinformation. That's what he said. He said, YouTube is an echo chamber that just, re just really confirms your bias. So if you're searching and looking, you know what Jesus said, seek and you will find. And on YouTube, that's absolutely true. On Facebook, that's absolutely true. Not only will you find, but you will refine and refine and refine the same thing that you're looking for because you are looking for it. And so he said it becomes an echo chamber. We've got to be careful about that. And I asked my, my doctor about vaccines in, in, in general and then specifically really about the COVID vaccine. And he said this to me, he said, the vaccine is probably the single greatest medical advancement that humanity has invented in history. Because a lot of the serious diseases and issues that we have, they didn't just evaporate and they didn't just disappear. They disappeared because people were vaccinated against it. And it meant that it kept the general population extremely healthy. It protects life. And for me, when I heard that, I thought, that, that sounds good. That sounds good to me. See, here's what I believe. And before I even get to the vaccine, here's what I believe really in general about medicine. Is there is a place for both miracles and there is a place for medicine. 
There is a place for medicine being taken by Christian people. That would be my position on it. And I think we'll find this in Scripture. In fact, I want to read a Scripture to you. It comes out of Acts chapter 28. And in this passage, Paul and Dr. Luke, I don't know if you would be aware of this, but these two guys were were stuck on an island and Luke was a doctor, a physician of his day. And here they are. And there is a young man who's sick. And so Paul goes to pray for him. I want to read this to you. Acts 28 verse 8, it says, And Paul visited him and prayed for him. And putting his hands on him, he healed him. Now the Greek word in that, for that word healed is aomai, which means miracle. I don't know about you, I'm all about the miracle. I want the miracle, I ask for it all the time. I want the instantaneous power of God in my life all of the time. Every problem I have, what do I want? I want the microwave version. I want it to be now. I want it to be quick. I want it to happen in a moment. And I want all the problems to go away. I love miracles. Hands up if you love miracles. Okay, so this is the miracle. Putting his hands on him, he prayed for him, he healed him. It was a miracle. Verse 9, and when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and they were cured. Now, the word for cured is different to the word for healed. And in the Greek, in the original language, it's therapeumai. And that word really means to provide care, to heal, and to improve one's situation. In other words, it's where we get our word therapy from. And so there is this, in these few verses, we find in one situation, God miraculously healed and intervened. It was a power of God moment. That's a miracle. We love that. And then just one or two scriptures later, what do we see? It's that people were cured. Why? Because Dr. Luke went to work and started helping people and ministering medicine to them. There is a place for both the miracle and a place for medicine. Now, this is what I believe. God, in His grace and wisdom, has given us an immune system that functions. But at the same time, it's not a sin to take medicine. So let's not make it one. No grandstanding, no issues here. It is not a sin to take medicine. Let's not make it one. I asked my doctor, I said, hey, is taking the vaccine, would you consider it to be safe? And his answer was, everything's a risk. See, if you're looking for a future full of freedom that's risk-free, I'm telling you, you don't have that. There's always a risk. There is a risk in taking the vaccine that you may react to it. There is a risk in getting COVID if you're unvaccinated that you may get really sick and in some cases that you may die from it. There are risks in both of these categories, but this is, and this is his words, not mine. He said, the risk of getting COVID and getting seriously sick and dying from it is greater than the symptoms you might experience or facing COVID without being vaccinated. The risk of facing COVID-19 without being vaccinated is simply greater. Again, his words, not not mine. But to a certain extent, you know, I kind of believe him. And the reason why I do is he is a doctor. He has taken an oath. He probably knows everything. He knows everything that I know. And so... So, so much more. He's aware of all the same information that you and I both have. And at the end of the day, this is his perspective. And I guess if we think that our doctors don't know anything and we want to listen to a a minority group somewhere, then that's our prerogative. But we we, we need to listen to someone eventually. And I kind of feel like this. We should value what experts say. I know, I, I said it. Insert the eye roll moment right here. But we should value what experts say, right? Why? Because GPs, they're not foolish. I mean, they didn't get their qualifications out of a cereal box. They actually had to go and study and learn and take an oath to preserve life. To me, this makes sense. But again, there are problems. And what are the problems? Well, here are two problems. Problem number one, right? There are educated people on both sides. So yes, I'm saying that I spoke to my doctor, but you could go and find a doctor that would completely disagree with the one that I spoke to. And so there are educated people on both sides. And it seems like the majority of people are getting vaccinated. Now, I'm not here to talk about lockdowns, but I understand that. 
I don't, know, I don't necessarily say that we could just look at the numbers of people that are getting vaccinated and say, well, everyone's getting vaccinated, so clearly they agree with it. No, I think something bigger is going on right now where people are, being get, are getting forced to be vaccinated and they're doing it against their will. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them against their will in order to get their freedoms back. I don't know that we should necessarily say that they are happy to get vaccinated. Maybe they're being compliant to get freedoms, but I don't think we can say the majority are doing it because they want to. I'm saying that there still are a lot of people that are choosing to do it. So who are we going to listen to? Who are we going to listen to? You know, different people are going to say different things. And I, and I want to say this. If you're a person that doesn't want to get vaccinated, not every vaxxer is a sheep. And they're not idiots and they're not foolish. They're smart, educated people that have looked at this and thought deeply about it and have decided in light of all the information that they have that they're going to decide to get vaccinated. And, and guess what? Well, the vaccinated people, the the anti-vaxxers, and I don't know if that's a derogatory term, maybe it is, and I'm not meaning to be insulting, but the people, let's say this, the people that don't want to get vaccinated, right? They are not long-haired hippies that use a rope for a bout and live off the grid with solar panels hitting their food in a tent somewhere, in a field somewhere that you don't know about. No, 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 no. They are smart, they are educated, and they simply disagree. I'm saying that what we can't do is just demonize people that have a different perspective to us and just assume that they're foolish because they don't know what we know or they don't understand. They may have everything that we have and have all the information that we have. They have simply arrived at a different conclusion. We got to make a choice. Who are we going to listen to? There is this tendency to sometimes want to listen to the whistleblower, the minority, the people that have nothing to gain. But guess what? People that have nothing to gain, they're still finding, you, you can find two opinions on this. How do we figure out? And, and one of the reasons why it's hard to figure out who to trust is because of this issue that I already talked about. This is problem number two. We have lost faith in our leaders. We've lost faith in our leaders. Every relationship moves at the speed of trust. So for a relationship to go deeper, there needs to be trust. And right now, we are in a season where since March last year and probably before that, our trust has been constantly eroded and eroded and eroded. And we're at a place right now where we say we don't know what we believe. I would say that on the whole, the general public seems to have a bad relationship that's low on trust when it comes to our government. And when they start giving us advice on what we should do, there is a question in our hearts and in our minds, why are you saying this? And what is this leading to? And are you setting this scenario up for something that you plan on doing later on? And where are your values? And where does your values align with? And, and, and so, you know, eventually, whatever you think, you're going to have to trust something. Or you're going to have to trust someone. Or you're going to have to make a stand somewhere. And I guess the reason why I'm saying all of this is I'm just trying to flesh out the issue and say, you know what, there are educated people that disagree with each other. And it's hard for us in the middle, especially if you, and, and, and come on, I'm a pastor, I'm not a scientist, so it's hard. I don't have that background. I've got to make a decision like you do. So what does the Bible say about vaccines? Well, nothing, right? But you know what the Bible does do is it frames how we should approach this topic. And that is a really important thing to understand. It frames our behavior around this issue. And I want to just drill in on that for a moment. Mark 7 verse 14 to 23 says, and, and these are Jesus's words. And he called the people to him again. And he said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he'd entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. They just, they never understood what Jesus was saying, apparently. Verse 18, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. From, for from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, 
envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these things, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Now, imagine that, that what actually defiles a person is not what is going into them, but what is coming out of them. Now, let me say, this is absolutely not a scripture that is affirming that anyone should get vaccinated. But it is making a very important point and one that I think we need to pay attention to. What makes a person unclean? Because in the spectrum of this conversation, in the spectrum of this issue, there are some people that would absolutely hold to the fact that in their hearts and in their minds, it would be a sin to get vaccinated, right? Well, hang on, what makes a person unclean? Back in this day, they said, what makes you unclean is what goes into you. Jesus said, no, 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 let me tell you, it's what comes out of you that's a real problem. See, I don't know if you're aware of this, but according to the customs of the day, if a Gentile, which is really just not a Jewish person, if they walked past a person, and get this, if their shadow was to go over the food of a person, of a Jewish person, their shadow could make that food unclean. And you think, this is wild. Where did they get this kind of stuff? Well, it was passed down through oral tradition. But if you start to look through the Old Testament and search the Scriptures and say, where did people come up with this stuff? You're not going to find it. In other words, what's happening is people are forming their perspective and they were trying to put words in the mouth of God. And I think we've got to be really careful when we take liberal approaches and put words in the mouths of God, in the mouth of God, right? Because apparently Jesus really didn't care so much about the shadows of the Gentiles over the food or what was going into them, but he cared so much about what was coming out of them. So much about how they handled issues, about all of the issues of the heart. Jesus cares about why, what comes out of your heart. And why am I saying this? Because there are some people, and let's just talk. I mean, I can't speak on behalf of everyone. I can't even speak on behalf of all Christian people, right? But there are some Christian people that are grandstanding on their moral soapbox right now, claiming that if you get vaccinated, you've got a serious problem with your faith and I just don't think that that's true. If you ask me, I would say Jesus is so concerned about what's coming out of the hearts of people as we navigate this deeply complex and, and, and situation that people have never really had to face before. And I think we should give heed to the words that are coming out of our mouths. If you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus, and here are the words of your Saviour. He said in Matthew, 6, 30, uh, in Matthew 12, 36, He said, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. So I wonder what's coming out of your mouth behind closed doors about other people when no one's there to hear you. Remember, Jesus is in this room. He's here. He's all around. He knows everything that's come out of your mouth. And I wonder if he would be so proud at the way with which you're handling the situation. Now I get the frustration and it's only exasperated by the fact that we've been in lockdown and no one is, is happy about that. We're all frustrated about that. But that doesn't give us the right necessarily to use careless words. At the end of the day, there's still some accountability for that, which really kind of leads me to my second point. How do you approach what you think? How do you approach what you think you know? Because that really matters. Shouldn't the, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, should not those things be the things that we can see coming out of people even in the midst of the situation? I mean, I get frustrated. Jesus got frustrated. I, I, honestly, guys, I want to be honest with you. There, there were days where I would wake up and I would say things to, to Pastor Sarah. I'd say, this is ridiculous. We just need to get on with it. And, and, that, and I'd have these moments where I'd be really irritated and then try to come back to earth. But I'm saying that these are the things that we should be ascribing to come out of our hearts. I mean, at the end of the day, didn't Jesus say, you will know my disciples by how they love one another? Right? Not by how they necessarily agree, but by how they love. And if we have to agree, listen, if we have to agree in order to love each other, then we're going to have major issues, especially when I talk about things next week. When we talk about the trans uh, community and, and the agenda, we don't have to agree with people to necessarily love them. Our world swallows the lie that in order to be loving, we have to agree. I, I just don't buy it. I don't think it's true. So, 
For some people, this is a pandemic. For other people, this is a plandemic. And they're concerned about the Great Reset and everything that's coming with that. And this is the, the, the you know, what's leading us into that. And, you know, I, I don't know all about this, but I don't think that this vaccination that we're talking about, for me personally, this is not the hill we die on. And maybe it is setting a precedent in some way. People are worried, well, if we're compliant in this situation, then doesn't that just tell our government that when they try to roll things out in the future, that we're just going to be compliant? I don't know what it says, but, but this is not that situation. And I think we've got to take our battles one step at a time. Since this is not that fight, then we will address it separately. But if should we ever come to a future where we have to be compliant and we know that that is that fight and that is a situation, we will have that fight then. We will deal with that then. So I, I, I look at this and I think, well, hey, what's the, what's the hill that we should die on? You know, what, what really matters? What will we fight for? And, and, and I guess I'm speaking a little bit personally now, but just to be honest and transparent, I don't think that anyone should be forced against their will to be vaccinated. And let's not make any mistake, that, that's what's happening right now. People are being pushed to do something. If they want to keep their jobs, if they want to stay employed, they're being pushed into do something. And sure, it, maybe it's your opinion that they should do it to protect and, and, and the safety of others. That's okay. That can be your opinion. But I don't know if we should ever arrive at a point where we get the right to command other people about what they should do. For me, when it comes to church, and I'm just being clear right now, when it comes to church, I don't ever want it there to be a place in our future ever. And I would fight for this where you have to be vaccinated to come to church. And I say this because this is a, this is a present reality and I'm hoping in the future that it's a non-issue. <clears throat> but right now, I'm saying that church should be open for everyone. If you want to know about Jesus, if you want to know about the gospel, then you should be able to come to church whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. And I get that there's probably a little bit of risk there, but you know what it is? Like ultimately, you know what I think? I'm kind of pro-choice here. I, what I think is that if you want to take it, fine. If you don't want to take it, that's your choice. And at the end of the day, when everyone's had the opportunity to be either vaccinated or unvaccinated, right? The chips are going to fall where they may. You know, at the end of the day, once we've all had the opportunity to, to get vaccinated, if you chose to not get it, well, you bear the consequences of your decision. If you choose to get vaccinated, you bear the consequences of that decision. But ultimately, I think it should come down to a church, uh, come down to a choice. But when it comes to the church, the church is open. Now, I don't know if you're ready for that kind of future, but it's one that's coming. Because there are going to be a time in our future where we have potentially vaccinated people sitting next to unvaccinated people. And how are you going to handle that? What's going to emerge out of your heart? There's so much fear that's controlling the narrative right now. And ultimately, what do I think? Well, I trust God. Absolutely, I, I trust God, right? But how does that play out when I have to enter into an environment where people have made a different choice or a different decision to me? I've already heard right now of, of stories, multiple stories of families that are not even going to meet at Christmas because one's getting vaxxed and the other one isn't getting vaxxed. And I think if you're a Christian person and you're willing to split and divorce relationship and, and move away from people, and in some cases, some people are going to, they're going to be frustrated and leave churches and that. Honestly, is this really where we're at? Is this really how we're going to handle it? For me, there's just no wisdom in this. By the way, this issue of whether you should face it with your immunity or, or, or get vaccinated or, or be in an environment that could be potentially dangerous, this isn't a new issue. You know, hundreds of years ago, there was a very similar situation being played out with a much more serious disease. And I want to read part of a letter to you. And in fact, in Martin Luther's day, the issue that they were facing was the bubonic plague. And the bubonic plague was terrible. I mean, in one day you could have fever, you have all kinds of issues, speech disorders, loss of consciousness. And so here in the middle of it, Martin Luther, now you can say what you want and you might consider yourself to be a spiritual person. But I think we all have to agree that Martin Luther was a wise and, and, and spiritual person, okay? So these aren't even my words, these are Martin Luther's words. So 
Here's Martin Luther and his wife who was pregnant at the time and they were urged to leave the city that they were in and people, Christian people said, hey, what do we do and how do we handle this? So he wrote what's you know, become called a, a pamphlet about whether Christians should flee and, and how they should handle this deadly plague. Let me just read a, a section to you. Martin Luther says, Some people are much too rash and reckless, tempting God and disregarding everything which might counteract death and the plague. They disdain the use of medicines. They do not avoid places or persons infected by the plague, but lightheartedly make sport of it and wish to prove how independent they are. They say that it is God's punishment, if, that, if God, that if He wants to protect them, He can do so without medicines or our carefulness. This is not trusting God, but tempting Him. God has created medicines and provided us with intelligence to guard and take good care of the body so that we can live in good health. If one makes no use of intelligence or medicine, when he could do so without detriment to his neighbor, such a person injures his body and must beware lest he become a suicide in God's eyes. By the same reasoning, a person might forego eating and drinking, clothing and shelter, and boldly proclaim his faith. That if God wanted to preserve him from starvation and cold, he could do so without food and clothing. Actually, that would be suicide. It is even more shameful for a person to pay no heed to his own body and fail to protect it against the plague as he as the plague the best he is able. And then to infect and poison others who might have remained alive if he had taken care of his body as he should have. He is thus responsible before God for his neighbor's death and is a murderer many times over. Indeed, such people behave as though a house were burning in the city and no one were trying to put the fire out. Instead, they give leeway to the flames so that the whole city is consumed, saying that if God so willed, He could save the city without water to quench the fire. No, my dear friends, that is no good. Use medicine, take potions which can help you, fumigate the house, yard and street. Shun persons and places wherever your neighbor does not need your presence or has recovered and act like a man who wants to put out the burning city. What else is the epidemic but a fire by which instead of consuming wood and straw devours life in the body? You ought to think of it this way. Very well, by God's decree, the enemy has sent us upon, uh, sent upon us uh, a deadly poison and deadly offer. Therefore, stop sending messages. I can't read this, <laughs> this, this, uh, this script. No more messages. <laughs> Therefore, I shall ask God to mercifully to protect us. And I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order to become con uh, not to become contaminated and thus perchance infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me and I have done what he has expected of me. And so I am not responsible either for my own death or for the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but I will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith. Listen to this. It's a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardly and does not tempt God. Martin Luther wrote that in 1527 AD. Martin Luther's point is simply this. If you can protect yourself and you can protect others, you should do it. But also, don't be full of fear and don't live in intrepidation and don't be overwhelmed by fear. And if your neighbour needs help, you should continue to minister, continue to do what you need to do. You know, for me personally, I think that, you know, if I get COVID-19, then I'm, I'm going to be okay. Even as... as you know, as unvaccinated, I think I, I would be fine, right? But I've got to be honest and tell you that everyone who's in the hospital right now, they probably thought the same thing. They thought, I'm not going to be in that minority. It's such a small amount of people. I'm not going to find myself there. Yeah, but someone does. Some group of people do. 
I was actually chatting with a person this week and her daughter uh, runs a, uh, a medical, r- runs one of the hospitals um, and, and, and specifically looks after a COVID ward where people are being brought in. And she told me that 100% of the people that are in the hospital right now are presently unvaccinated, 100% of the people. Now, if you look at the state of Victoria, and I don't know where the vaccinations are right now, whether you've had your first shot or your second shot, but to say, statistically, if you just look at the fact that 100% of the people that are in there, that they are unvaccinated, to me, that kind of says something. And here's the sad part that she added. She said, right now, they're trying to choose between who's going to live and who's going to die and who should you know, be able to be helped and who can't be helped. And that's a story that we don't always get to see. And so when it comes to me, do I have faith for it? Yeah, absolutely. Do I believe in my immunity? Yeah. Do I think God will protect me? Absolutely. But some people are, end up, are going to end up getting really sick and die if they, if they don't face it, you know, with being, in terms of being vaccinated. Like, how, how does my decision, and I have to think about this, how does my decision impact the health of other people around me? So if I had probably another 20 minutes uh, of this message, which I absolutely don't, and you're welcome, um, I would probably take Romans chapter 14, and I would fully try to break it down and go into some detail. But what I'm going to do is I'm just kind of, I'm going to half do that. um, And I'm going to read out some scriptures. And and I know that this is normally very wrong and I wouldn't normally edit the scriptures, but I'm just being honest. I'm going to edit them right now in front of you and, and see if this makes any sense. This is from Romans chapter 14. But as for the one who's weak in faith, welcome him. And don't quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may get vaccinated while the other person says, I shouldn't get vaccinated. Let not the one who is vaccinated despise the one who abstains and let not the one who isn't vaccinated pass judgment on the one who is, for God has welcomed him. And who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands and falls and he will be able to be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person thinks we should absolutely get vaccinated. And the other person says, no, 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 we definitely should not get vaccinated. Well, you know what? Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who gets vaccinated does it in honor of the Lord. And the one who doesn't get vaccinated does it in honor of the Lord. And it goes on. But my point is simply this. And Paul was trying to make a point when he wrote that scripture about food being sacrificed to idols. His point was that Christian people... We may agree on a lot, but we do have different consciences. And and we're seeing, and this is a present reality, we are seeing right now that you can have two people that have the same doctrinal belief, but have a different conviction over what they should do when it comes to this issue. The apostle goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, guess what? Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Right now we are seeing a puffing up from people that say, I know more and you know less and you should agree. Uh, You know what he says? But love builds up. And Paul's emphasis on all of this was that you should love people. You've got to err on the side of love. This is what Jesus said. Now, I'm not saying anything about whether you should get vaccinated or not. I'm saying how you deal with this issue really matters. Paul also makes a really interesting point here. And it's one that we don't really hear very much about. There are a whole heap of sins in the Bible that we would say are absolutely and categorically sin. There's no gray, right? But then he also says that for one person in his mind, if he is going to violate his conscience and he believes God has told him not to do something, right? then you have to be really careful about that. For him, it's like he's going and sinning because he's going against what he believes God has told him to do. And, and the point is, is that this is just different for different people. So you can agree or you can disagree, right? But just do it well. This is unity, not uniformity. In uniformity, we all have to say the same thing. But with unity, we allow there to be some room, some difference, but we're still united in heart and spirit. And at the end of the day, we believe a lot of the same core things. And I think that's where we're supposed to land. I think what's happening right now is so divisive that in some circles, not all, but we are seeing a fracturing of church relationships because people hold different convictions about things that are not necessarily spoken about in the Bible. So this kind of brings me to my final point. Finally, what do experts say about 
the vaccine. I know, I said, insert the eye roll moment. But we got to listen to someone somewhere. You know, a couple years ago, I decided that what I was going to do was to renovate my bathroom. And I walked into it and I looked around and I thought, I think I can do this. I said, with the skills that I have and learning as I go and a few YouTube clips, I reckon I can renovate this bathroom. And I almost decided to do it, but I have this kind of asterisk in my mind. It works all the time. It says, hang on, remember something. You don't know what you don't know. And I said, well, that's true. So maybe I should just get a, a builder to come in and look at this and tell me what I should think. So I call up my friend Shane Van Cedars and I say, hey, could you just come around and tell me about renovating this bathroom? Well, he comes over, he walks in and he looks around the bathroom and he starts to list off a stack of things that I had never thought about, things I didn't know about. And I said, you know what, you just do the whole thing. Why? Because I'm not an expert. Whatever I do, I, I'm, I'm going to try, but, I, but I, I don't really know. This is not my area of expertise. Why, why, why am I saying that? Well, I'm not a scientist, you know. This is not my area of expertise. So I'm sifting through data kind of like you are. But at the end of the day, what I can do is I can choose how and where to do my research. And so I have watched so many clips and pieces of information. And, you know, I, I, I came across one that I thought was extremely helpful to me. And, the, and, and I've watched a lot of clips from both medical Christian doctors and I've watched a lot of clips from, from people that were um, educated and smart and, and, and this one seemed to help the most, right? This comes to us from Dr. James Yun, who's part of the Christian Medical and Dental Fellowship of Australia. And this is, this, these are, I mean, I had so many questions and answers. I've tried to reduce it to five for the pur purpose of today. Now contained in the information that I'm about to give, there are some stats um, and you can either choose to believe this or you can choose to disregard it, right? So when it comes to this vaccine, one of the things that I've heard the most is, oh, it's not been around long enough to know the efficacy. All right, well, as of the 7th of August, so, you know, months ago, 4.36 billion people in the world have received the vaccine. In fact, 40.3 million people are getting it per day. That just simply means that there is a huge amount of data that's coming in. And admittedly, we are not looking at this data in five years, so we don't know what's down the track, right? But we are getting heaps of information about this vaccine right now. In fact, if you go to TopMed, and let me tell you what TopMed is, because it'll be lost on you if you don't look at it, right? But TopMed is a program. It's part of a broader precision medicine initiative, which aims to provide disease treatment tailored to an individual's unique genes. Now, if you go there and you search up COVID-19, and this is like months ago, it actually spits back a result. You see 164,000 articles and information. I mean, people are researching this stuff all the time. By the way, you know what you get if you look up tetanus? 29,000. What's my point? There is so much data that actually is coming in. There's a lot of information and research that people are doing. So far, and this is at the time of when this was produced, research shows an 80% efficacy rate, meaning it reduces the spread of COVID by 80%. In control groups, so placebo versus vaccinated people, the Pfizer vaccine was 95% effective in vaccinated groups. AstraZeneca was also really good, right? I'm not a doctor. I'm just telling you what genuine Christian educated researchers have shared. Is it effective against the Delta strain? Well, it's less effective against Delta. No vaccine is 100% effective in the sense that there will be from time to time breakout infections. But you know what? Um, let me give you an example. Like penicillin doesn't work for everyone. If I take it, I will have a reaction to it. I, I'm allergic to penicillin. But I'm not going to advocate that we should get rid of penicillin everywhere because I have a reaction to it. I wouldn't say that at all. It's actually good for a lot of people. So from 164 million people that were vaccinated in the United States, 7,525 patients were hospitalized and died. That's four in 100,000, which is pretty significant. One of the questions that I had, and guys, trust me, I've got all the same questions. I wanted to know everything because I care about what goes into my body and I care about my family. 
One of the questions was, well, what about Israel? They're fully vaccinated and they're still having all these breakthrough infections. So the infection rate is going up, but the death rate isn't. And if you look at Indonesia, the death rate and the infection rate, they parallel. So the data seems to show consistently that if you're vaccinated, you're less likely to die. Well, what about the side effects? What about blood clots and all that? Okay. There are 93 cases from approximately 6.8 million doses and six people died. That risk is eight per 100,000 vac vaccines or vaccinations, right? Compared to penicillin, which I'm allergic to, penicillin anaphylaxis kills four in 10,000. In fact, you might not know this, but 500 to 1,000 people die every year from penicillin anaphylaxis. The risk of being struck by lightning by comparison is eight in 100,000. So my question is this, I get it, there are some risks. There's no risk-free future here. Everything's gonna be a risk. I guess we just gotta decide what kind of risk that we wanna take moving forward. How long would you wait before making a decision? I don't know. I don't think you've got five years to decide how you wanna face it. Well, well, actually that's not true, you are. You're deciding right now, however you wanna do it. One of the questions that I had, I said, well, hey, how come they keep changing the age of AstraZeneca? It's like they're not telling us something. No, 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 I didn't understand this, but then it made sense to me. The data didn't change, but the more people that were infected, the risks changed, which means the benefits increased. It was why they kept changing the age. I didn't get it either. Now, everything I just said, let it blow up the internet right now, because everything I just said is extremely controversial and there was a, a, a whole heap of people that just may totally disregard and say that maybe that's tr not true. And I didn't write it. So I'm presenting to you what Christian doctors who are well-researched and educated have found after researching this over and over again. They're in the search of truth, just like we are. So finally, should a Christian get vaccinated? <laughs> well, you know what I think? I think you should speak to your doctor. I think it's not the same for everyone. I think that you should speak to your GP. I think that you should realize that they are smart. They are educated. You can run your worries, your fears, your concerns by them. But the reality is because of the issues that are in our culture right now, some of you will just, you'll never trust your GP. You'll, you'll never believe what they say. But I feel like we should. Is taking the vaccine risk-free? No, absolutely not. I mean, there is a risk if you take it. There's a risk if you don't. So guess what, everyone? Choose your own adventure. Decide how you are going to face it. And, and, and whatever you decide, well, you just have to live with what happens after that. But here is my real point today. Is that getting vaccinated, it doesn't shipwreck my faith. It doesn't shipwreck my faith. And it didn't shipwreck Martin Luther's faith. You know, I, I am a person that believes in the miracle. I believe in the power of God. I know, I can, I can, I've seen miracles. I know that God can do it, but I've also experienced that God doesn't always do it. You know, probably about two, maybe two months ago, I hurt my back in a really bad way. My whole back seized up, I was in, I mean, I'll really tell you, this was so bad. It was so painful uh, and I prayed. I said, God, you can heal this. I know you can do it because he's got the power to do it. I prayed and I waited and I gave God a window because I trust him. And you know what? He didn't heal me. Not then and there in that moment. So the next thing I did was take some pain medication and I called my physician and I asked him, what should I do? And, and, and I just started booking appointments. I took some muscle relaxants so my back wouldn't seize up so I could get better and, and get healed. And there, in other words, therapy. Just like Dr. Luke administered to those people on the island. I wanted the miracle. I wanted what Paul gave to that young man. But instead, I had what Dr. Luke gave to his patients. This is not a sin to take medicine. It's not wrong. And by the way, if you take the vaccine, it doesn't mean that you have no faith. It just means that you've read everything and you've arrived at a certain conclusion. And, and that's fine, you know. So vaccinated or unvaccinated, it doesn't make a difference to where you end up. It doesn't make a difference to your faith. I don't believe it. Here's the thing, the biggest problem that we have is not actually COVID right now. Humanity's number one problem, and this is the pandemic, it's sin. Sin is a major issue. And if we don't deal with it right now, we will pay the penalty in eternity. And so 
as a person who has this same issue, sin, right? I believe that I'm saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He is the vaccine for the ultimate problem that we have. He brings eternal life, but the penalty for sin is death. So if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, it's not gonna make a difference to your eternity. You're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So for me, when I look at all of this, where do I lie? What do I think? What do I, where do I stand, right? Well, if I just step back for a moment and I look at the big picture, I would say it seems like getting vaccinated would help. And I know that there are other medicines out there, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, all these other things. And I actually even asked the doctors about that. I said, what about that? He said, well, we don't have access to that. So, you know, the best way to forward is really to, to get vaccinated. I said, okay. Now, whatever you think, whatever you believe about those alternative medicines, I guess my perspective is simply this. It looks like getting vaccinated helps people to fight this thing. And so it's not gonna shipwreck my faith and I'm okay about it. But here's what I really believe is that how you treat people that disagree with you and how you do relationships with people that think differently to you, I really think that Jesus cares so much about that. He cares about so much about what's coming out of your heart right now. So what we re need right now in our, in our culture, we need, we need wisdom. We need God's grace. Thank God we called this year, the theme of this year at Bright Church, grace upon grace, because that is what we need right now. We need His grace and His wisdom. So let me pray for you today. Father, this is such a tricky situation to navigate. There are opposing perspectives on both sides. Everybody's thinking different things. Lord, I pray that you'd help each one of us to navigate this journey. Lord, we understand that this issue, it's not gonna shipwreck our faith. It's not an issue in that regard, but it's easy to get worried and be overcome by this. I pray right now that in Jesus' name, that no one would be overwhelmed and be given to a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Let us have what other translations would call a sound mind right now in Jesus' name. You haven't given us the spirit of fear. God, ultimately, we believe that our future is in your hands and you're gonna lead us on to an incredible future, a bright future in you. We're gonna go on to do mighty exploits in your name and we trust that and believe that whatever comes, our ultimate eternity hangs in, the, in your hands. It's in your hands, sure. But God, give us wisdom for how to avail ourselves of things that could help us at this time and this age right now. I pray grace upon grace to be multiplied to your church. I pray favor to be upon your people. I pray a spiritual protection to be on those. And Lord, we know this virus isn't going anywhere. So for everyone that gets it, Lord, I just pray that your hand of grace and protection and your healing power would be all over them right now. And for anyone listening to this who currently does have COVID, uh, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you be healed. I ask for the miracle. I ask for the total restoration of their body in Jesus' name. And I pray, God, that we'd, we would see your hand and your power at work in their lives. So pray, God, that in the church community, Community, that we would see yes, grace, and maybe truth. And there are different versions, God, but I pray for grace right now. Grace, grace to be upon your church. I pray, God, that we would love each other. I pray, Lord, that the fruits of the Spirit would be what emerge and that we would be known by how we love people, not people that agree with us, even people that would disagree with us. And I pray that this would be a Christian distinctive. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you've never given your life to Jesus before, we want to give you a, an opportunity to do that right now. And uh, I told you the biggest issue that we have in the world right now, it's not COVID, it's, it's sin. The Bible says the penalty for sin, the wages of sin is death. I know that we all die, but some people go on to eternal life, which means that death is simply a gateway to eternal life, but others go on to eternal death. You can either be with God for eternity or you can be separated from God for eternity. And if you wanna make a decision today, to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He's paid the penalty for all of your sins. And if you make a decision by faith to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, then you will, whatever happens in this life, you're gonna have peace in your heart that you go on to eternal life in Him. So let me pray for you right now. And if this is you, you could just repeat this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me, that you died on the cross for my sins. I receive you today as my Lord and Savior. And I choose to follow you every day for the rest of my life. 
In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the very first time, whatever happens in this life, God has got you for eternity. There's a link that's gonna pop up in the feed right now. If you did say that prayer and you meant it in your heart, you knew that was you and you believed that message, right? Let us know who you are because it may have been some words that you spoke today, but that's attached to an entire lifestyle that we would love to help you to navigate and to walk out. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for being part of today's service is not over because we're gonna stand and worship our God. Amen.